this is Terry Beatley, your host of What If We've Been Wrong? I'm shining light into some dark places so that beauty, goodness, and truth defeat the schemes of the enemy. It's true, people are perishing for lack of knowledge, and we're instructed to have nothing to do with the evil deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what I do on What If We've Been Wrong? Rethink, explore, and uncover some hidden truths so that more people can experience an abundant life and the joy of being set free from the shackles that hold us in prison. Welcome to What If We've Been Wrong. Uh, Mother Mary elevates women to a height that no other feminist has ever been able to do. And yet she's graced with humility, with tenacity, with perseverance, but she is um, just a, a, a bouquet of love and I believe today 2018 2019 going forward women of America need a, a different uh, choice if you will of women to look up to so this is my Christmas gift to you um, a, a real interesting talk and my guest today is Julie Easter and Julie is well schooled well read and I asked her would she be willing to come onto the show with me today and we'll just sit back and have a fun talk about Mary and hopefully you're gonna learn some things that you've never known before about Mother Mary a woman who all generations will call blessed Julie welcome onto the show well it's great to be here Terry and thanks so much for having me oh. I'm excited to talk about my favorite woman in the world <laughs> well she's my favorite woman <laughs> in the world too in fact on December 8th each year in the church calendar and this is not just for Catholics but December 8th is the feast day of the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of Mary such a special day so Julie Mary is so misunderstood she's either not understood or misunderstood and and I just thought a good place to start is with this word typology what are we talking about when we talk about how the New Testament and the Old Testament are, are connected through this typology what does that mean well the authors of the Old Testament you know even whether they may not have even been aware of it were there are many, many types of Jesus and Mary both in the Old Testament. For instance, uh, Moses is a type for Jesus, you know, who leads his people out of the wilderness. As Jesus is the leader of, you know, the king of the Jews, he, he was too. Mm -hmm. And so there are many, many uh, examples of, of types for Jesus and then also for types of Mary. For instance, Esther uh, of the Old Testament is a type of Mary. Um, many of your listeners may be familiar with Our Lady of Fatima. And Our Lady of Fatima appeared on the 13th day of the month for six months in a row. Uh, what's interesting in the book of Esther, Esther saves her people on the 13th day of the month. Mm -hmm. So there's a type, you know, with it. It's kind of looking, projecting forward to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So test, old, old Testament, New Testament scholars love doing that, you know, looking through the Old Testament to see where these types might have been, you know, that look forward to Mary. Uh, one of them is the Book of Wisdom uh, that kind of projects about Mary and her, and her wisdom. Uh, that she is the seed of wisdom. You might be familiar with that title, Mary, seed of wisdom. There were also many, many references to her in the Psalms. Uh, so I was not really familiar for, about these things until I read a great book. I'll tell your listeners, the, the book is called The Glories of Mary. It's by St. Alphonsus Liguori, who is a doctor of the church, meaning that he wrote many, many things that were unique. There were 35 doctors of the church. And uh, he's a great saint that lived during the, uh, the 18th century. So he was born in the late 1600s and lived in the 17, uh, 1700s. And this is when his book was published. He, he's the author of many, many books. So. Mm -hmm. But... His, uh, his book, The Glories of Mary, describes uh, how the saints 
looked at Mary, the, the titles that Mary received. One thing that I thought was really interesting that I think your listeners will, will uh, you know, I think be surprised at. One thing you notice when you read the New Testament is how many Marys there seem to be. You're exactly right. You know, in fact, have there were three been... Marys. Yeah, there, You've counted them? Yeah, there, why are there so many Marys? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's a reason for that, and that is that in Jewish tradition, um, the mother, the, the uh, Messiah's mother was known to, that her, her name would be Mary. And so all the Jews knew this for centuries. They knew that when the Messiah would come, she would come to the mother, and the mother's name would be Mary. So sometimes Jewish families would have several Marys within the same family, hoping so they, they that their daughter hoping. would they wind up being the mother. Yeah. <laughs> they were all hoping. <laughs> That their daughter right, they were hoping the that their daughter the would be the same, the mother right. of the same. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. And that's the reason. There's so many. So you have three Marys at the foot of the cross, you know. Uh, and you think, why is that? One is the actual mother of the Savior, and two were wannabes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so okay. I just think that's interesting that, uh, that they well, had that tradition. So going back to the typology, so in the Old Testament, I mean, there were, what, three major types of, I guess you'd say, typology of Mary showing up as Eve, and then the Ark of the Covenant, and then the Queen. So I, I thought it would be beneficial to explain this. What do we mean by Eve foreshadowed Mother Mary? So we're talking about Old Testament, New Testament. How, how is fallen Eve foreshadowing Mother Mary? How does that work? Well, you know... Eve is the, the, the woman who decided to say no. She was the woman who was disobedient. Uh, Mary had to undo what she did and instead was obedient to God and said yes. Mm-hmm. So Eve is, you know, sinless because she was created that way. Mary, also sinless created that way, but both had the full consent of the will to sin. Mm -hmm. Eve sinned, Mary did not, Mm -hmm. and so was able to reverse the original sin of Eve. And, of course, Mary is the new tabernacle, which the Old Testament tabernacle, which housed the staff of Aaron, the manna that the uh, Israelites lived on, the manna, the bread of the desert. Mm -hmm. Oh, what was the third thing? The Ark of the Covenant was the law, right? So you had the uh, you the had Old the Testament readings, yeah, the, the manna, and 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 so you also had Mary as a new Ark of the Covenant, how the Word in her, inside her. So you know, and also the bread of life, who was Jesus Himself. Right, but I mean, um, I've been told before, and the staff of Aaron. Right, the staff of Aaron. That's it. so she carried the high priest <laughs> in her. Now, I, right. I mean, I've been told before. Oh well, you know, God had to choose somebody to carry. You know, Jesus. What's the big deal? Mary, Mary's a container. I've actually been told that by. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter who. I don't want to point out anything. But but anyway, it it was very denigrating. He's like, wait mm-hmm. a minute, wait a minute. Mary, God chose this woman to carry the savior of the world, um, in her womb for nine months. It's like, um, I mean, just intuitively, there's something really, really special. Now, so in addition to undoing the the sin of Eve, in addition to being the new Ark of the Covenant that, that physically, literally carries the Son of God, what about this whole queen factor? What's What's that about? Well, you know, the reference in Revelation chapter 12, right, is about um, the woman who is clothed with the sun, right, and is the mother mother of Jesus. So you have this uh, long discourse about describing Mary. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I want to say, though, is there are four places in Scripture that talk about the woman. In fact, Mm-hmm. There have been many conversions just from people who study Scripture and have noticed that these four places um, are connected. So you have Genesis 3.15, 
-hmm. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thy seed and her seed. She she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. That's the quote. Okay. Now, many of the different translations translate that as he shall crush thy head. This is God talking to the serpent. Right. Um, and I think this is a, a big error, you know, because it really takes away from Our Lady's place in salvation history. Right. So, so before we go back to um, Revelation, you know, this, can you explain the history of how, I mean, because that's huge, Julie. I mean, the, the average Bible out there will say, he will strike at your head. It's like, no, she will strike at your head. Mm -hmm. So can you review the history of like how and when this got mistranslated? It's almost like it was an in intentional yeah. to once again, you know, to try to, I don't know. I mean, it, if I was yeah. a radical feminist, I'd be complaining about this. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Why would you change she to he? So, well, and I think it is a deliberate attempt to kind of take away her role. So, um, the, 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 in simple terms, the history of Scripture, right? Scripture began in, uh, written in Hebrew then was translated into Greek, which was more and more people were uh, speaking and writing in Greek. And then the first English translation, well, then it was translated into Latin, which was the language of the church, and also Latin was being spoken all over Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> then we have the translation from Latin, it's called the Latin Vulgate, into English. And the first translation of this, which is considered to be uh, the best, and uh, the original translation is called the Douay Reims uh, translation or version of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It was the Old Testament was published at this college called the English College of Douay. And then another one, the New Testament, also in an English college at Reims, which was um, published in 1582. So it's not even that long ago in right. the scheme of things, you know, 500 years ago. <clears throat> but um, one thing that's interesting is, you know, there was a lot of discussion. There's a there's a church council that was convened called the Council of Trent, and this council lasted from 1545 to 1563. Pretty long council, almost uh -huh. 20 years. And uh, there, it was definitively this council of all the, uh, you know, all the bishops from around the world declared definitively that the translation of Genesis 3.15 was she and not he. Ooh, and I, wow. I thought after, after reading that, I thought, you know, how does this get messed up, though? But it did. In fact, several even of the Catholic Bibles say he and not she. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a problem because it is foreshadowing Mary from very beginning of creation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and and you realize that, then you, the next time you see the woman spoken about is when? At the wedding of Cana. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the wedding of Cana, which is, woman, what is that to me and to thee? Where, you know, she's asking Jesus to do something about the shortage of wine. They have no wine. What is that? And you think, why does Jesus call his mother a woman like that? Mm -hmm. It seems out of place. Why wouldn't he say mother? And the reason is because he's identifying her from, you know, this point on as the woman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think it's a, a wake-up call. You know, this is the woman who is spoken of who will crush the head of the serpent. Right. Um, then you have it again. When when does that happen again? At the foot of the cross, right? And here Jesus sees his mother and he says, woman, behold thy son. And you think, once again, why would he say woman instead of mother? Exactly. <laughs> so it seems out of place. And so he, you know, he's doing it for a reason. And then you see it one more time in Revelation, a woman clothed with the sun. And what's interesting about that, too, is that we have an actual image that embodies uh, that title, which is the Tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe. 
Now, most you people have the no Toma. clue when you say Our Lady Guadalupe. And I remember a number mm -hmm. of years ago, I, you know, I was in my, at least in my 40s, I had no clue what Our Lady of Guadalupe. So can you give a quick summary uh, and then why this um, clothed with the stars and the moon under her feet, why that's so key with this tilma uh, from uh, yeah, this is a this is a Marian apparition, okay, that happened in the 1500s, happened in the 1530s, uh, which is something because it happened at the very time that the Reformation was happening in Europe. So at the very same time, you have this Marian uh, apparition, so appearances of Mary, to a peasant who's a new Christian named Juan Diego, um, and in this in these uh, appearances to him, she instructs him to go to the bishop who's in Mexico City and uh, request that a temple be built there um, where she is appearing mm -hmm. and that it should be in her name. You know, of course, all temples are there so that we can worship Jesus, but it, you know, as in many of the churches in the Catholic Church are named for Mary, mm -hmm. you know, in her honor. So she wanted that built there. Uh, the bishop wanted proof that it was Mary because she identified herself as the mother of Jesus. So uh, Mary made these flowers, these beautiful roses grow in the dead of winter because this happened in December. Uh, and they were indigenous to Africa, these roses. And the bishop was from Africa. So this was supposed to be a sign to the bishop that she was who she said she was. Um, the tilma is this rough horse blanket kind of thing that all the peasants used on their donkeys. And they gathered things in them, or they could use them for warmth or whatever, but, uh, you know, they were just a kind of a utility blanket. He gathered up all these roses in the blanket, walked miles and miles to Mexico City, and when he finally went, got to see the bishop... And guess what, Julie? Guess he just what? Kind of guess what? Before you tell the, tell the rest of the story... What? We're going to be right back, so don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Julie is going to tell you what appeared on the tilma, and it is the second most highly scientifically studied uh, religious relic of all time, and it's still in existence today. Don't go anywhere. Come right back, because we have more of our Christmas gift 2018 to you today. We'll be right back. The Out Loud Perspective awaits you in life, love, politics, a healthy lifestyle, your faith, personal development, and living an out loud life on AmericaOutloud.com. Blitz your news and entertainment network where you can listen 24-7 on our free apps on both Android and Apple. Welcome to the new era in communications, America Out Loud Talk Radio. back with Terry Beatley and Julie Easter and Julie you were just getting ready to tell us that in 1530s this peasant who's now known as Saint Juan Diego he was carrying uh, these flowers um, uh, to, uh, to the bishop and pick it up from there because something miraculous happens right and in fact um, there were a room full of people who witnessed this too so there were people who had been waiting to see the bishop and there were just little groups around the, the room where he was. And he brought in his blanket filled with roses and just spilled them out onto the floor, um, unbeknownst to him because he's holding the blanket. And the image sort of flashed up. You know, that's the description of it when I look at the, the historical descriptions. Uh, flashed up and landed on the blanket. It, it just it looked like a painting, but... You could tell that it wasn't a painting. Um, the reaction of the bishop was to get down immediately and prostrate himself <laughs> on the floor uh, because he realized that here's this miraculous image that is given as a gift because he saw it, the blanket was blank, and then all of a sudden the image was there, which is impossible. Uh, and, and, of course, the roses were just a, a secondary thing. Um, the image, though, is over 500 years old. Well, almost, I shouldn't say that. It's 1531 when, when this happened, so not quite 500 years old. 
Um, but this, all the things, all the symbolic uh, meaning of the image caused nine million Aztec Indians, who were the indigenous people there in Mexico, to convert to the Christian faith, this new Christian faith. And, of course, this was a huge thing because at the time they were sacrificing people to their sun god and by the thousands. And there was this horrible ritual um, that they did to, to appease the sun god. And so many, many uh, of the, the Indians were dying from this. Um, and so you have, you know, the Spanish missionaries coming in. And this is why Juan Diego was a new Christian. You know, he had been baptized by the Spanish missionaries. So you have this amazing relic that people from all over the world go and visit. Uh, some of the things that are amazing about it are that it is because it's on a horse blanket, which is made of cactus fibers, it should have deteriorated um, in under 10 years. It should have just rotted. Because it's made of this very rough fabric. Uh, the color on it, they've done studies, there's no paint. There's color, but no paint. No pigment of any kind. They can't explain why there's color on it. Um, there have been doctors who have actually examined the eyes of the image. So it's a, a picture of Our Lady who is standing on the sun with the rays of the sun, or standing on the moon, the crescent moon, with the rays of the sun emanating behind her, clothed with the stars. So there are stars all over her outer garment mm -hmm. and her robe, I guess. And also, the there's a what looks like a little angel at the bottom looking up, which, you know, they traditionally said that the face of the angel is the same face of Juan Diego. Oh, which is really no, I had not heard shocking. That. Okay. Huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, so, um, so you... yeah, there's, there's just a lot of little things about it. All right. And when you go back and you look at the... Revelation chapter 12, the woman and the dragon. So it says, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. This is exactly what's on the tilma. And I spent most of my adult right. life never, ever hearing this part of, you know, our Christian heritage. We don't, we, you know, so many people right. don't hear this. And then um, says so she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Um, okay, so, so, and so we encourage people, go look up Our Lady of Guadalupe. So we're, we're, we're again, we're talking about... Um, confirmations of the of the role of this amazing woman named Mary so we we've so, we sort of kind of sped through this I'm actually going to go back so we've talked about typology so we understand that the New Testament lies hidden in the old and the Old Testament is revealed in the new um, Julie do you remember you know reading in the Old Testament the stories of some of the women like um, I think you pronounce her name Jael or JL um, in the Old Testament, and I think it was in Judges, where she drives a, a, a tent peg through the skull of the Canaanite general Sisera. Um, and so, it I means so God used a woman to crush the head of this horrible Canaanite general who was trying to destroy the Israelites. Uh, do you think that's a little bit of foreshadowing of Mother Mary? <laughs> yeah, I would say so. That's yeah. great, you know, and you have many, many strong women figures. Jude, I think Judas is Jude. one. Yeah. I'm trying to think. No, Judas, mm -hmm. isn't she the one? No, she um, beheads. Judith beheads. <laughs> because it's interesting because. Yeah, women there you go. Crushing crush. the head. Yeah. Um, so she beheads. So it's like you've got all this old, and I know there's another one, but I think she's unnamed, if I'm not mistaken. Something about like drops a rock or a millstone on. I don't know, some horrible man's head. He was one of the leaders. I forget that story. But um, but it's head, head, mm -hmm. head. As yeah, she shall crush thy head. He, no, the God is talking to the serpent. Right. She, the woman, she shall crush thy head. You shall lie and wait for her heel. I just said this is why the devil fears Mary more than any other being. Julie, I think uh, the... 
the, the rotten fruit of sexual politics and radical feminism today uh, is, is synonymous, or, or not even synonymous, I think it's a glaring example of the reality of Satan using hurt women to try to, again, divide, conquer, take our country down by using hurt women. I can imagine the hate mail that's going to come at me, and I really don't care because I'm standing up for the greatest feminist of all time, Mother Mary, you know, who had every reason to abort her baby back then because they could have stoned Mary to death. But she chose life, and she chose to bring life, and that's, that's life for everybody. You know, then and now, she brought the Savior of the world into the world. And, and, and she's full of tenacity and perseverance, but beauty and love. And, I mean, we could probably go down a list, a long list of you know, adjectives that would describe her. And so we've talked about then the typology, some of the women in the Old Testament who literally, not just figuratively, but literally crushed the head of generals and leaders who are trying to hurt the Israelites or, or crush the Israelites. Um, now, we've talked about Mary as the queen, queen mother. You know, explain again, though, I don't know if you touched on this, how the mothers, the mothers of the kings, would sit beside their sons. Like, because you kind of think of it, oh, it's the wife of the king. No, it was the mother of the king. Do, do you know the history of that? Yes. You know, well, you know, traditionally the mother had a much more prominent role because, of course, the mother is blood-related, right, to the king. Mm -hmm. So th this is where the, the term the queen mother came from. Ah. So the queen, the queen mother had much more influence on the king than even the queen did mm -hmm. um, as an advisor, but also just her role as, as an authority figure with the people. So, uh, you know, that's not accidental either that, you know, Mary as the mother of Jesus should have such a prominent role. And I think, too, it's important to, to realize that over the last century where Mary has been sent by God into the world many, many times, hundreds of times, and, you know, there are appearances her, of her at Fatima, at Lourdes, in Africa, in Japan, you know, all over the world. And all you can think of is why? Why is, are they sending her? Exactly. So why <laughs> why not? Have... Why isn't Jesus just coming? You know, right. he, could, he could come. Mm -hmm. But they're sending her. They're sending her for a reason. And I think the reason is because she has been so neglected mm -hmm. historically. And uh, that they, they want to really have the attention be on her because, you know, her, she is not in scripture. She says very little. We know very little about her. But now there have been great mystical works written about her. Um, there's called, there's a book called The Mystical City of God, which uh, is a mystical work all about the life of Mary. There's also one about St. Joseph that's like that. So we have so many mystical works in the church. A lot of people aren't aware of that are given to us because we don't know about their lives from Scripture. And they were such important lives that some of the saints just dictated. They had uh, these, these works dictated to them by Mary herself or by Jesus. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I, as a convert, was like a kid in a candy store finding out about these things. Well, because, you know, I thought, wow, you know, and of course, why wouldn't we have these things? If we can believe in the resurrection, <laughs> which is a very mystical event, right? This is not something ordinary. Why couldn't other mystical things be true? Well, and I and think of course, it strengthens they are. our faith. Yeah, I mean, because we know, but mm -hmm. it still amazes me that Mary has appeared in every country of the world, some countries, numerous times. It's so well documented, and but still, though, most people, Julie, never hear about this. 
they they just don't hear it. and then if they do and you get excited about learning about this then then the attack comes it's like oh well you have to you you can't basically it's like an either or mentality you either love jesus or you love mary you cannot love both and it's like that's crazy i mean jesus god chose a woman to bring the savior of the world into hallelujah and um and it's like why not why not celebrate her celebrate her celebrate what she, who she is what she did and um and and who she drives and the example that she brings yeah. absolutely yeah. the example that she is you know i mean i think mary it's it's crucial to follow her example and and in following her example we can be most happy mm-hmm. you know i think i read a study that said that uh in a national survey of american women we are the most unhappy at this period of time than we've ever been well i can believe the founding that. of the country oh yeah yeah and and the reason is because we aren't following god's plan for women expound uh, on that really. his plan for women is for us to emulate well his plan for women is for us to emulate the ultimate woman mm-hmm you know, and and in doing so, we can be the most happy. God has the bl- the blueprint for happiness. He's given it to us. It's called the Ten Commandments and the uh, Beatitudes. Mm-hmm. And in trying to follow those, um, He wants us to have life in abundance. He says that mm-hmm. I came to give you life in abundance. What does that mean? Well. You know, we can be happy in this life, but we have to follow the rules. Just like children are miserable if they have no rules. If they have no bedtime, if they have no, you know, they're never told no, they're miserable. And you, all you have is chaos in the house. Mm-hmm. But once they know what their rules are, what are the, the parameters in, in which they have to function, they're much happier. Right. Uh, and we're the same way. So, you know, this is one of the things I, I try to tell people is, well, you know, maybe you're miserable because of your own decisions. Right. You know, you are far away from God. <laughs> and, well, and, and Mary uh, you draws made us back wrong to the terms. Lord. She draws us back to the Lord. Yes. I'd, I'd seen this beautiful quote, uh, the one who accepted life in the name of all and for the sake of all. She's the one, who, and I remember when I went to Italy, and uh, and I did go to the Vatican, and I saw the, and I always pronounce it wrong, the Pieta, the Pieta, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Pieta. Pieta, yeah, I always get that Pieta. wrong. <laughs> For, uh, carved by Michelangelo of Mother Mary holding her son, Jesus, after he had been lowered down from the cross, and, and she has him laying across her lap, and what impressed me the most that Michelangelo did was that he didn't express Mary's pain on her face, as is my opinion. He sculpted her with this look mm-hmm. of peace. And I remember I wrote in my yeah. book... Um, serenity. Yes, it was serenity, absolutely. Because when you think about it, it's like, okay, the Immaculate mm-hmm. Conception... And then you know, and she it's you know, and then she realizes what's going to happen and what is happening. I mean, can you? I, I don't even like going there, even imagining. But can you imagine being Mary and looking at your son um, be scourged at the pillar? You know, those the crown of thorns crammed yeah. into his head, and then I mean, the skin's literally falling off his body. And then he's forced to carry, you know, a beam of the cross, and then having to watch your son be nailed onto the cross to take all the, all the sins, all the yuck of all of mankind. I, I mean, when you just pause, even if you don't believe in Jesus, at least stop for a second and pause and think what that would have been like to be a mother, to see all of that done to your son, who you've loved from the moment. You know, an angel told you you were going to bring the Savior of the world into the world. It's just worthy of pausing. What do you say, Julie? Well, I think many church fathers have pondered that, you know, and they have said uh, that when she says, or when Jesus says to her, woman, behold thy son, there is a mental communication between them, you know, in which she says, he's saying to her, 
um, will you sacrifice me too? The father is sac- my father sacrifices me. Will you sacrifice me too? And she says yes. And then also agrees to what? Be our mother. And he immediately says, behold thy mother. Julie, with that thought, hold it. We're going to be coming right back to talk about how Jesus gives us a beautiful mother. We'll be right back. Think back to the last time you felt healthy and energized. The best times of our lives occur when we're at the peak of our health, sleeping better, full of energy and focus. We know that fades with age, and you might be feeling the effects of aging as low energy and poor sleep. But it doesn't have to be that way. There haven't been any nutrition systems designed to rejuvenate our bodies as we get older until now. Healthy Cell Pro is the only multinutrient system that impacts the building block of your body, the cell. Created by anti-aging expert and Nobel Prize nominee, Dr. Vincent Giampapa, award-winning Healthy Cell Pro cuts through the complexity of nutrition supplements by simply giving you the purest ingredients, filling dietary gaps to nourish your cells and enhance your quality of life for optimal performance. Visit HealthyCell.com and use code OUTLOUD for an exclusive discount or call 844-869-9958. America Out Loud. It's a groundbreaking news and lifestyle platform that requires top-tier analysts, strategic thinkers, and impressive commentators. I'd like you to meet Dennis Santiago. His expertise includes strategic warfare, asymmetric warfare, arms control, and global stability. He's a columnist and commentator on America Out Loud. Dennis, as a global stability analyst, how do we foster a more stable environment globally? We need to foster respect among nations. We need to foster constructive engagement between nations, and we need to make the respect of the values of each nation an important thing for everyone well said how can america out loud bridge the gap and bring back trust to the people we serve there is a dire need in this country to have constructive discussions that bridge the gaps and isolation that have been created by things like the internet this is an essential platform for making that happen well our goal is simple It's to deliver an honest analysis and diverse opinions to keep you informed. All back at AmericaOutloud.com. International news, world events, or living a quality life. Welcome to the new era in communications, America Out Loud Talk Radio. In that last segment, we were sort of wrapping up, but I'd like for you to go over it again. When Jesus was on the cross, his message to both his mother and to John, can you expound on that, what he said, and then what, what do you really think was behind this? What, 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 it's a deeper meaning. Yeah, I, what I was saying is that the church fathers had pondered this scene where Jesus says, Woman, behold thy son. And, you know, on the surface, it looks like he's, he's giving his, his mother to John. You know, he's entrusting his mother to John. And then says to John, behold thy mother. Um, of course, we have a different understanding of it uh, once we ponder that John can represent all of us. You know, he's not only the beloved disciple, but he represents all mankind at that moment. Because, you know, when, when he says, woman, behold thy son, there, this is a second fiat, or, or yes, uh, that Mary gives. Her first fiat being, um, be it done unto me according to thy word, mm-hmm. which is, you know, at the Annunciation, where she agrees to be the mother of the Savior. And then here she's agreeing with her son to also sacrifice him. Uh, That, you know, this is her sacrifice too, not just the father's sacrifice, but her personal sacrifice, that she will sacrifice her son for the good of all mankind, Mm -hmm. in expiation for all the sins of mankind. Mm -hmm. 
And then also she agrees with one more thing, and that is to be our mother, our heavenly mother. Um, and I, what I was saying is that in Scripture we see something good coming out of a situation, any situation where Mary is involved. Mm-hmm. And we see that, you know, at the wedding at Cana where she suggests that they have no more wine, and he says, woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. He's arguing with her because he doesn't want his public life to begin because he knows that once it does begin, he's on the path to his own passion, right? his death. Mm-hmm. So, but she prods him. She, you know, is, is really asking him to intervene here. And not only does he do it, you know, she right after that says, do whatever he tells you, mm-hmm. which is really the advice for all all people everywhere to do, do whatever he tells you. Okay. Yep. And so, and so they go and fill up these huge, you know, vessels filled with water, gallons and gallons and gallons. And he, in a public way, turns it into the best wine that there is, and an abundance of it. So, you know, we are to gain from that that um, if we go to Mary for things. <laughs> a, a lot of the time, our prayers answered beyond our wildest dreams. Mm-hmm. You know, if we use Mary as the intercessor. Oh no, I was, I was going to say that's the part I think a lot of Protestants don't understand uh, to use Mary as an intercessor. So I thought this might be a good opportunity to reflect on Martin Luther. You know, who founded Protestantism, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, what did he think about Mary? I mean, was he like, ah, oh, that's a Catholic thing and we're not touching that. Uh, but what were his thoughts? Yeah, I don't believe that he that he had a lot of the problems with Mary. You know, and I, I think when Martin Luther died, he regretted a lot of what had happened uh, as a result of him being against many of the things that needed reform within the Catholic Church. You know, but... Um, you know, I don't, I don't really know that he had any objections to what the Catholic Church had thought about Mary up well, until the, the then. But I do that, know that, you know, of course, Luther is only one part of the Reformation. You have uh, Henry VIII, and you have Anglicanism, and you have Calvinism. Mm-hmm. And so there are all different kinds of thought coming in to take away from really the dignity and the elevated stature that Mary has. Mm-hmm. In the, the, the reading that I had done on Martin Luther, he did not, he did not, um, actually he wrote extensively on, uh, she's the mother of God, he wrote on her, um, and he believed in her, immacu- that she immaculately conceived, he believed that she was perpetually mm-hmm. a virgin, and he believed in the spiritual mother, that she was the spiritual mother of all Christians, um, and he was mm-hmm. not opposed to praying the Hail Mary prayer, and so I just think, gosh, it's it's she's not just for mm-hmm. Catholics; she's for everybody. But what about the uh, the the fathers, um, uh, the the original church fathers? What did they think about Mary? Oh, well, they are the ones that you know are the authors of the Litany of Loretto. Okay, but most people don't know what that is. What is the Litany of Loretto? And these are like all the titles that Our Lady is known for. Star of the Sea, uh, Seed of Wisdom. You know, there, there are all these different titles that she's known for, uh, mm-hmm. Gate of Heaven. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they are part of the tradition of the church and what the saints have come up with to describe her role. I think, I think one of the hardest things and one of the, the problems that, that people have in, in Christianity uh, is just not... Uh, knowing about the saints. They don't know about the lives of the saints. They don't know how a person becomes a saint. What is the canonization process in the church? Um, If they did, they would have much more respect for what it means to be a saint. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when when you know that the church tradition is based on a lot of uh, what the saints thought, said, wrote, you know, that's the body of work uh, in the church, and when I say tradition, you know, a lot of people, particularly Protestants, they they think that that is a uh, 
a terrible word, you know, that we shouldn't have tradition. We should we should just look at scripture. And of course, scripture comes from the tradition of the church. There was no such thing as a written Bible until you know 400 years. I'm trying to think when the, the printing press was even invented. But for hundreds of years, you had no Bible. You only had the oral tradition of the church. Mm-hmm. And actually, the stained glass windows that we see, and, and then murals before that, told the stories of the church mm-hmm. because people didn't have Bibles. And so if it weren't for the oral tradition of the church, the Bible would never have been written. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, there are also many scripture passages. I think you know, there have been people who have, converted because of the scripture passages or lack thereof you know where is it written in the bible for instance that the bible is all we should believe in it nowhere isn't. is it written that no i mean the, no yeah no right no in fact it does say hold fast to your tradition right right <laughs> so, uh, it also says that the church is the bulwark of the truth not scripture the church yeah. Because scripture can be changed, as we've seen. You know, scripture has changed all the time. Thomas Jefferson, a lot of your listeners might not know this, uh, was a deist, and he took the Bible, he took all the miracles of the Bible out, didn't believe in them. And so he had the Bible reprinted without the miracles in them, and each co- every, every University of Virginia student got a copy of the Bible minus all the miracles. Yeah. So, you know, changing the Bible is... <laughs> Uh, really a sin and people should care about what the original translation is because it matters a great deal when it comes to interpreting the bible well so, so that takes me back uh, to how i always tell people the show with the I, with the reality that they've changed they whoever they are over the years have take have changed she to he you know will crush thy head yeah you're talking about how you know, yeah. So, yeah. Words do matter. World views matter, and then those words matter too. <laughs> oh, so, right. Mm-hmm. Words do matter. Yes, they do. As far as like parting thoughts on what you wish every American woman would consider, just consider about our Blessed Mother Mary. Um, you know, if you could wrap up one thing in a gift, Christmas gift with a bow, an idea, a thought, what would that be? What would you, what do you hope every woman would understand or reconsider or consider for the first time about Mary? Well, I think it's important to ponder who Mary was and who she still is, right? We believe that souls exist or they exist for all time. I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding that. You know, because we're, we live in a secular society. When, when you're dead, you're dead kind of thing. So, you know, I would, I would just say read scripture, the mystical works, if you really want to know who Mary was. And uh, I, I, for me, the mystical works have really opened my eyes as to what and who um, the importance of Mary really is in, in the size because she's not in scripture very much. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that praying rosary, I would always say praying the rosary is such an, a critical part um, because you are meditating on the life of Jesus through a devotion to Mary. Oh, well, wait a minute, to, Julie, praying the rosary, Jesus I thought you were praying to a bunch of beads. It's a bunch of rocks or beads. <laughs> Aren't you praying to be? No, it's not. Oh, okay, so explain. No, uh, what fact, the, but okay, explain it. There's a lot of people, Julie, don't understand. What what is this praying the rosary? What 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 is this? And what just kind of sum it up mm-hmm. with the few minutes we have left. A rosary is is a, a series of prayers meditating on the life of Jesus. That's what the rosary is. So it has much more to uh, to do with Jesus than people realize. Um, Many of the prayers, the Hail Mary prayer, which people might be familiar with. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. And while you were saying this prayer over and over, because you say it 50 times when you pray the rosary, 
you are thinking about what is happening in the mystery um, that you're meditating on. So there are uh, four mysteries of the rosary, four different things that, that just based on what day it is. So say it's a Friday, uh, we'd be meditating on the sorrowful mysteries on Jesus' passion because he died on a Friday. And so there are five decades of the rosary where we're meditating on the five different time periods in his passion. The agony in the garden is one time period. The second one is the scourging at the pillar where he is scourged. Then you have mocking, spitting on him, and crowning him with thorns. That's the third one. The fourth one is hearing his cross, Calvary. And you meditate on the stations of the cross. And then the fifth one is the crucifixion and death of Jesus. And you're meditating on what is going on with him while he's on the cross. It's just a very powerful way to connect with Jesus on a daily basis through Mary. That's what the rosary is. And, and I just wanted to share, too, what I found is that it takes, you know, like 20, 25 minutes to pray the rosary. And there is no other time during my day, my week, that I can be um, so focused and, and just taking me back, you know, at least twice a week. And, and actually, my favorite days to pray the rosary are Tuesdays and Fridays, which are the sorrowful mysteries. Because I think we, it's so right. easy to forget what Jesus Christ went through and the sacrifice that his mother had to make and, and what she had to endure. And maybe it's the mother in me. I don't know. Um, to, I just cannot imagine being a mother and having to watch your child go through what her son Jesus Christ had to go through because he took our sins and he, you know, we receive him. He's washed us clean. And so, uh, anyway, so I just want to put in a plug that to me, those are some of the best 20, 25 minutes of every, of every week. And yeah, that Hail Mary is prayed, how many, was it 50? Yeah, 50 times on one, 50 times, on yeah. one rosary. Yeah. And so it's not so much the repetition, the repetition, it's in that repetition comes the peace and that peace to contemplate so it's not just lips flapping it's like you're i mean if you're you know unless somebody's falling asleep but your brain is focused on what that one decade what that one you know series of 10 hail marys is focused on like the scourging so your mind is actually thinking about Jesus Christ tied to that pillar and they're they're flogging him and they're peeling back his skin and and he's whew, it's just it, it really many times yeah, and when you tears. and many people can do that can do a meditation you can do it from scripture but you can also do it from the passion of the christ the movie you know just remembering those scenes right uh, i just want to share too that saint faustina one of the great saints of the church and one of the um later saints you know she was not made a saint until recently until the year 2000 and lived in the 1930s jesus appeared to her many, many times. One of the things he said that I love, that it, one of the parts that uh, she shared in her diary, is that he said, those who meditate on my passion have a special place in my heart. Mm. You know, and I thought, wow, that is such a, a powerful thing. He, he knows it when we meditate on his passion and his sacrifice for us. Well, I think that is a... a a huge plug. Well, that is a huge plug, and we are out of time. And it just made me want to say that, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. And it's just Grand time for people yeah, to, to, <laughs> to receive that peace that he gives us, and that God chose a woman to bring the Savior of the world um, uh, through. And I just think it's such a perfect time to elevate her name, Mary, you know, our Blessed Mother, and because she's a mother for everybody. And so for people out there who are wounded, who are hurt, who are crying, and who, who want peace, just take a look. Take a little quick look at our Blessed Mother, and then it, cast your gaze on who she puts her gaze on and her gaze falls on her son jesus christ 